All right, splendid. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're about to embark on what's just going to be an amazing next few weeks as we read Virgil's marvelous, devastating, sublime poem, The Aeneid. Before we start, though, I want you to have a little bit of grounding in just what you're about to get into. So Virgil's Aeneid is a poem that was originally written in Latin. So you might have read other poems that are in this genre. And this genre is called epic poetry, right? Extensive long poems dealing with uh, individuals and heroics and often uh, national level scales of war and decision making. Um, so examples of this that you might have read are Homer's Iliad or Homer's Odyssey. Um, we're not gonna get into the stakes of calling it Homer, but um, be aware that those poems are written in Greek and Virgil is aware of them as well. And so he's frequently going to be referencing them. A lot of that's going to not be of great interest for us as we read uh, the Aeneid. We're going to largely let the Aeneid stand on its own. Um, they're written in the same form though. So it's not just epic poetry, but it's also uh, a very um, measured uh, metrical form called dactylic hexameter. But that's just uh, kind of besides the point. The dates that we're looking at are near the end of the first century BCE. You might be thinking in like the 20s BCE. And uh, there's just a few more things that I want you to know. So let's get into it. So the first thing that I want you to know is Aeneas is a Trojan and he's leaving and we'll find in book two that the events actually will pick up immediately after the end of the Trojan War. In the Iliad, which is the material that covers part of the Trojan War, the last year of the 10 year siege, um, the war doesn't actually end. We don't see the end of the war. So one of the things that we do is we get some of those details um, in other epic poems, um, part in the Odyssey, and then in a bunch of fragments that don't survive, as well as tragedy. But book two of the Aeneid will really flesh out a lot of those details of the last night, um, including the description of the Trojan horse, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Um, but Aeneas does appear throughout the Iliad. In some ways, he's kind of a random person for the Romans to pick as their founding hero, but that'll be a discussion perhaps for another day. Let's just look at four examples of Aeneas appearing in the Iliad. Uh, these examples are all going to come from the marvelous website, Poetry and Translation. So that's where I'm getting these translations from. So in book four, which is Diomedes' Aristea, his moment of uh, great martial uh, prowess, uh, we have the following. At this, they mounted the ornate chariot and drove the swift team eagerly toward Diomedes. Sthenelus saw them approach, the son of noble Capaneus, and quickly warned Tidius's son, Diomedes, dear friend, here come two warriors, strong beyond measure to fight you. One is the archer Pandarus, who boasts he is the son of Lycaon. The other, Aeneas, claims Anchises for a father, Aphrodite as his mother. Wheel the chariot and give ground, I beg you, lest you lose your life in the fury of the attack. So the thing that I want to draw attention to here is, uh, obviously, uh, Aeneas has a reputation as a fearsome warrior, so that's important to know. But the main thing is his parentage. All right. So Anchises is a mortal, and Aphrodite is a goddess. So he is semi-divine, right? He's a demigod. He has a, a divine parent and a mortal parent. Aphrodite, in Roman uh, mythology will be called Venus. And so you won't be seeing the word Aphrodite, you will instead be seeing Venus there. Um, later, uh, the battle uh, when Diomedes and Aeneas fight doesn't go so hot for Aeneas and his mom intervenes. Now Aeneas would have died had not Aphrodite, Zeus's daughter, been quick to notice the mother who bore him to Anchises while he tended the herd. She flung her white arms about her beloved son and spread a fold of her shining robe to shelter him from weapons, lest a bronze spear hurled from a swift Danaean chariot might pierce his breast and end his life. What I want to point out here is that we see Aeneas um, being cared for by his mom. 
And we're going to see Venus in the Aeneid frequently show up and talk to her son and intervene in other ways on his behalf. Having a divine patron fits in a number of different ways. You might think of Athena in book one of the Iliad or the relationship um, between Athena and Odysseus throughout the Odyssey. Uh, Aeneas appears sporadically throughout the battle books of the Iliad. Uh, his last appearance though is in book 20 where he goes against Achilles. So God went against God. As for Achilles, he was eager above all to face Hector, Priam's son and Sate, the god of war. Ares of the stubborn oxide shield with his blood. But Apollo, stirrer of conflict, roused Aeneas to fight the son of Peleus and filled him with strength. Likening his voice to that of Lycaon, son of Priam, he spoke, Aeneas, counselor of the Trojans, what has become of the threats you made as you sat drinking with the other princes to fight Achilles face to face? And uh, so now Aeneas gets roused and then he and uh, Achilles battle back and forth. Uh, it's striking there, actually in fear of one another, a number of interventions by the gods happen. Uh, and in the end, Aeneas does not win. Um, on hearing this, Poseidon, earth shaker, plunged through the midst of the battle and the hail of spears toward the space where Aeneas and Achilles fought. In a moment, he veiled Achilles' eyes in mist, plucked the ash spear shod with bronze from brave Aeneas' pierced shield, and set it down at Achilles' feet. Then lifted Aeneas and swung him into the air, high over the ranks of warriors and lines of chariots, so that with the power of the god's hand, he came to earth in the far edge of the field, where the Cacones were about to join the fight. Um, so here again, we see divine intervention. Something you might be thinking about as we read the, Ili uh, the Aeneid is, uh, what's going on by picking this hero who so frequently needs aid? Um, all right, so let's move on. There's three kind of references that you need to know um, in order to really understand the striking opening of Juno's, uh, of the Aeneid, where it's Juno's anger, right? So we're gonna have this phrase, like what was the cause of um, such a great anger for a goddess? Like, how could she be so mad? And the poem will lay it out in a parenthetical of only three lines. Here it's four lines in our translation. And it's important to know these things to think about like, why is Juno, Hera in Greek, going to be so hard set against Aeneas. And that'll be the primary conflict running throughout this poem. And so we read, and here the translation is coming from poetry and translation again. And the cause of her anger and bitter sorrows had not yet passed from her mind. The distant judgment of Paris stayed deep in her heart, the injury to her scorned beauty, her hatred of the race and abducted Ganymede's honors. So, Let's look at these three things briefly. We have the judgment of Paris, we have the hatred of the race, and we have abducted Ganymede. So here uh, in a very striking version of the judgment of Paris by Renoir, um, we're gonna talk about this. So once upon a time, a mortal man named Peleus, who is Achilles' father, married a sea nymph named Thetis. They ultimately they will have a child, Achilles. Um, but the thing here is there was this massive wedding between a mortal and a god. The gods invited everybody, but they did not invite one person in particular, and that is Eris, goddess of strife. And so in the partial revenge, she takes an apple, a golden apple, and she throws it into the middle of the wedding feast. And somebody picks it up. And on this apple is written the words, for the fairest, for the fairest. And immediately all the goddesses are like, hey, it must be me, it must be me. But three in particular claimed the right to be the fairest. And those goddesses were Juno, Hera in Greek, Minerva, Athena in Greek, and Venus, Aphrodite in Greek. And they couldn't settle the argument. And so they decided, you know what, we should go ask this Trojan dude um, what to do. 
And everybody's like, yeah, great. Like, we love, like, the idea that Paris can decide. Like, let's go find a youthful prince who's currently shepherding on a mountainside to figure this out. And so they get Hermes. This is our buddy Hermes here. And uh, Hermes takes the goddesses to um, Paris. And you can always recognize Paris because he's wearing this cap, which is called a Phrygian, Phrygian cap. Um, Got that little doodad. And they're like, hey, tell us who's the fairest. And he protests. He's like, oh, I could not possibly. How in the world would I tell you who is it? Like, he's terrified, trembling in his pants. And they start bribing him. Hera Juno says, I'll make you the greatest king that ever was. You'll rule over vast lands more than have ever been ruled. Minerva says, Ah, I will make Minerva Athena. I will make you a brilliant military commander and warrior, um, chief in stratagem, chief in strategy. And you know, Paris is getting pretty excited by that. He's like, "Oh man, cool, man! How do I decide?" But then Venus, Venus comes along and says, "I will give you the most beautiful woman in the world." I will give you the most beautiful woman in the world. And that woman, of course, is Helen. And this is also the moment that's going to start off the entire uh, Trojan War cycle. Because our friend Paris cannot hold back. He's like, yeah, Helen, Aphrodite, you are the fairest. And then Juno is spurned. And so that's why earlier it said injury to her scorned beauty. And that's why I said injury to her scorned beauty because she was, um, Paris chose somebody else as being the most beautiful, like the fairest. So hatred of the race. This one's a little bit harder. I don't have quite as much to say about it. Um, that's because Dardanus, Dardanus the, is the head of the Trojan line. So the Dardanians are the same thing as the Trojans. And he's the son of Zeus and Electra. Zeus, of course, is the husband to Juno. He's always off having these affairs. And so he's therefore a product of Zeus's infidelity. So in a way, Juno views the entire Trojan race as offsprings that remind her constantly of the unfaithfulness of her husband. Um, and the last example is Ganymede's abduction. So one day Zeus was flying around and he saw um, the most um, beautiful boy he had ever seen before. This is a Trojan youth named Ganymede, and he took the form of an eagle and he raped him, meaning both to snatch him away, but also to take sexual advantage, um, sexual violence, and he took him up to Olympus to pour his wine. So there's a moment that this is mentioned in the Iliad here, and um, this is copied from Lattimore's translation, which Wikipedia helpfully provides under the abduction of Ganymede page. So we learn Ganymede was the loveliest born of the race of mortals, and therefore the gods caught him away to themselves to be Zeus's wine pourer for the sake of his beauty, so he might be among the immortals. There's a little bit of difference here, right? This one says the gods did this to bring to Zeus. In most versions of the myth, it is Zeus himself. And this is a frequent piece of art. So you see here I have um, Peter Paul Rubens's adaptation of this, um, but you also have this on uh, Athenian uh, base painting. So here, we have Zeus, here we have Ganymede. Ganymede is pouring the wine, and we have that reminder of the element of the eagle in the myth. So the last thing that I wanna emphasize is um, the geography of the Aeneid that we'll be encountering. So we're going to pick up in book one, uh, somewhere kind of around here-ish, uh, here, um, and a big storm. And our first location will be here in Carthage. We started in Troy, right, with the Trojan War. And then Aeneas does all these wanderings. So this is the edge of modern Turkey, all right? Carthage is in Africa. And these are the modern terms, right? Like these are, these are um, I'm drawing attention to this because I want to emphasize this is not um, a poem just about uh, Europe. 
right, and about Rome, because we're going to end here in uh, um, Laurentum, Estonia, Cunai, uh, kind of what this is going to be Rome, right? So this is a poem that is all about the area of one specific sea, one specific sea or ocean, and that, as you can see, is uh, the Mediterranean, all right? So we're working in this area, and this is the Mediterranean Sea. So I look forward to um, picking up with book one with you uh, next time. Enjoy and so long.